It's time now for Bloomberg Equality, where we examine the bottom line impact of diversity. And my next guest has been studying how the quarantine is shrinking our networks. Marissa King is a professor of organizational behavior at the Yale School of Management, and she's an expert on social networks. Marissa, thank you so much for joining us. The quarantine is clearly changing the networks of everyone, of women, of men. What have you found in your research? Yeah, after this year of profound social isolation, my colleagues and I found that networks have shrunk by close to 17%. But while many people are experiencing this profound shrinkage, in fact, the pandemic has affected men's networks far more than women's networks. Men's networks have shrank by almost 30%, but women's networks have hardly shrank at all. Just to be clear, are we talking about social networks or professional networks or both? Both. It's really hard to disentangle how much of it is our close relationships, our social relationships, and how much is work. But what we're seeing is that people are really turning inward and focusing on friends and family. And that's really at the expense of their professional networks, this outer layer of acquaintances, casual colleagues, people we don't see as often. So when it comes to men's networks shrinking more, does it suggest that men have more transactional contacts in their network, uh, more so than women? And Without a lot of that face-to-face -face interaction, that contact means a little bit less? That's part of it. Men and women fundamentally maintain their social relationships differently. Women tend to maintain their social ties by talking with other people. But Robin Dunbar, a professor in the UK, has found actually, in contrast, men tend to do things together. And since they simply can't be doing things, they can't go bowling, they can't play playing soccer, they can't be at the bar, that their ability to stay in contact with one another has diminished. But it's not just that they maintain their ties differently, the way that they utilize their networks and they call upon their relationships also differ. For instance, within those conversations that are happening, women are much more likely to ask for help. And that willingness to ask for help, particularly during this difficult time, has allowed them to maintain strength in their networks that men just haven't been able to do. Interesting, interesting. Women's networks apparently also have greater gender diversity during the pandemic. Why do you think that is? One of the biggest benefits of shifting to virtual work is it's allowed for greater gender diversity and in interactions. Women or men are communicating more, for instance, particularly on online platforms. If you think about oftentimes in that workplace, there's strong pro prohibitions about women and women even doing simple things like having a meeting together privately or having lunch. And since we shifted to virtual work, many of those social prohibitions about gender cross interactions aren't as salient. Yeah, that's true. It's much easier to have a, a, a conference call than it is to step out of the office with someone, uh, especially if you might not have felt comfortable with them before. Of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Everything's kind of different now, but at some point we'll get past it. What's your sense of whether these smaller networks are permanent? Uh, and, and what does that tell us about whether we're better off with bigger or smaller networks? In general, what we see is that during major life transitions, the, the impact that those have on our networks tend to be enduring. For instance, oftentimes the shift to parenthood is one of the biggest changes that networks face. And during that time, our social networks often just fall off a cliff, never to recover. So over time, our networks actually tend to get smaller and smaller and smaller. They're largest when we're 25. And that doesn't really change unless people are really conscious about maintaining social relationships. So post-pandemic, it's going to be absolutely critical to reconnect and reestablish relationships that may have fizzled out during this time of social isolation. Companies and CEOs, Marissa, as you know, are highly aware of the effects of working from home and people being uh, disconnected from one another and the shrinking networks and also the loneliness and mental health issues that may result. And one of their solutions has really been to encourage people to come back to the office. Does that actually work? There's no substitute for face-to-face -face interaction. My colleagues and I have studied are there other effective substitutes. And what we see time and again is that video conferencing is not an effective substitute for face-to-face -face interaction. And so while everyone doesn't need to be in the office all the time, ensuring that people are in the office at least half the time, research has found is going to be the most effective way for maintaining social relationships, but perhaps also giving people the flexibility and the benefits of working from home. Okay, so the number one tip then to maintain and at least build on the quality of the social networks that we do have now, what would be your advice? To reconnect. Our relationships hold a lot of trust, and many of our best ideas come from people we haven't talked to in two to three years. And while it can be off awkward at first, I feel like I haven't reached out to someone in a long time, why would I want to reach out now? Everyone, imagine just being on the receiving side of this. People are desperate for social connection. They want to help. So just simply reach out and make that a part of your regular workday. 
All right, really interesting research here. Marissa King, professor of organizational behavior at the Yale School of Management. She is also author of the new book, Social Chemistry, Decoding the Patterns of Human Connection. Certainly a lot to, to look at there right now.